Yes, I hope everyone is looking forward to this as much as I am, because I have been living the macrobiotic lifestyle for over 50 years now, 51 to be exact. And uh, uh, it was love at first sight, and uh, I'm still in love with macrobiotics, and I'm happy to be able to share my experience with everyone, because uh, this is certainly something that is a, a, a compounding of in experience over the years. And uh, so this is a great format, a great platform to be able to do that. And so I'm looking forward to my my time here. Uh, <clears throat> once my daughter came home from school and asked me, what is your job, dad? Because everyone, in all the kids at school are supposed to say what their, their kids did. And uh, she wasn't exactly sure what I do. <clears throat> So I just said, well, I show people how to transform their sick state into the healthy state. That's what I do. So we got that clarified. <clears throat> well, today I'm going to talk about a specific issue, which is how food affects us mentally. And anyone who's tuned into the macrobiotic uh, way of thinking knows that we, we seek connections, we look for connections, where other people are seeing just <clears throat> separate things. Like, uh, say, I've got a state of depression, but it has nothing to do with my food, you know, that kind of thinking. So I just need to talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist and get it all worked out. Uh, and there's something called nutritional psychiatry today, which is actually showing a scientific basis for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's very common sense that the food we eat every day has a big impact on our uh, psychological state, and I would even um, dare to say that it's impossible to really get into a balanced state without considering food because it nourishes the, the nervous system. Well, it'll be the focus, and then I'll just throw in a little bit at the end. I want to um, just give some tips on how to detox yourself or others if you've been jabbed with the uh, the notorious or the uh, the famous uh, <laughs> vaccine that uh, the world's been talking about. Um, I get a lot of questions from people. You know, they may be forced to do it to keep their jobs. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous that you you know you get forced to do these things, but that's the way the world works. And so I get a lot of questions of people like, "How can I undo some of the damage?" So I just want to touch on that a bit, uh, just in case you know someone who's in that situation, because it's a very valuable information. And I think in the course of this year, we're going to see more and more of these uh, <clears throat> delayed side effects coming. And uh, this information is, is valuable. So what I'll do is get right into my uh, PowerPoint program, because I do like to have time at the end for questions. Uh, usually a lot of questions come. In fact, some people tell me, they find the question and answer session to be the best part of what I do. And um, a lot of my, <clears throat> a lot of my uh, ideas are very controversial. So, uh, you know, it does generate a lot of questions. Now, I think in this group, it's going to be much less controversial than it is out in the, uh, just the, <laughs> the general public, because people have already got a, a certain interest in this kind of thinking, and uh, it's nothing really revolutionary. So there we are. So everyone can see that now. Great. Eating the Wu Wei. Macrobiotic food for body and mind. Now I'm just going to explain to you how I came up with the idea of Wu Wei. <clears throat> Wu Wei, if those of you who have read Taoism will know this. In fact, when I present a lecture, I used to do them in person. Uh, then uh, if I got a chuckle from someone, I knew this was someone who has read Taoism because uh, Wu Wei is the basic principle of Taoism, which means not doing. So the idea is that we just go with the flow of the Tao or the great natural order, the order of the universe, as we call it in macrobiotics sometimes. Wu Wei means not doing. So instead of consciously trying to manipulate something, we try to adapt ourselves to the greater flow of nature and just go with that. So Wu Wei, this is the international way of phonetics to write it. And so I've just done an English play on words. And I've now translated this book into German. 
And um, of course, plays on words don't work uh, when you translate. So I got to come up with a different title. Um, and uh, there it is, Eating for a Longer, Healthier Life. Um, <clears throat> so I, I chose this uh, title, first of all, to just have a little bit of fun with it. But the, the yin and yang Tai Chi here, uh, I chose because I was looking <clears throat> on the internet for different um, yin yang symbols for, to put on there. And I looked, saw, you know, hundreds of them. And this was the only one I really liked for my book because it shows the dynamics of yin and yang, which are this polarity of energy that we talk about in macrobiotics. And we see that this is not a static ball with two dots, <clears throat> but rather the, the artist who did this <clears throat> captured the dynamic quality. There's a, a movement in that. Uh, a transformation in that. So that's that's how it came up. <clears throat> and it's got a lot of recipes too for those that uh, like to go from theory to practice. <clears throat> but I've had that out for six years now and uh, it's made my my job as a, um, as a health coach much easier because people get confronted with all this information and they get overwhelmed by it. So the way of self-healing. Now, this is not new to most people, but I've just got some basic things here just to be sure that everybody is hanging along here with me. So macrobiotics has to do with the holistic vision of life. And that means that we see symptoms as being connected to our environment. So if I do have some kind of allergy, it's not just because um, you know, I have allergy genes or I just had bad luck. But there's something has gone wrong in the way I am relating to my environment, and I have the responsibility to change something. <clears throat> and overcoming symptoms <clears throat> is not true healing. So the way we see things is like a chain reaction. And we look at the illness or the symptoms, and then we follow it back. So we're a bit like, you know, the famous Sherlock Holmes. We're trying to go back and find out, you know, what's the culprit that started this and ended up, you know, with the, uh, the crime. And we all know the let food be thy medicine. You know, who hasn't heard that one? And that's exactly right. Let food be thy medicine. And that means you have to change something if you want to have a change in your condition. And the key element of macrobiotic lifestyle is, of course, that we're willing to take responsibility and we're willing to change. Now, I've got a Latin expression here that uh, grasps for me macrobiotics, and that is simplex sigillum veri. Simplicity is the sign of truth. Those of you who are interested in language like me will notice the very for truth that we have the English word verify, verification. English has taken a lot of words from Latin. <clears throat> and also medicine, the word medicine comes from medi, meaning middle. <clears throat> so you restore balance. So, you know, your blood pressure isn't too high, it's not too low. Your pH is not too high, it's not too low. Everything is in the middle. That's, that's what uh, health is. And medicine should be the art of bringing us back to the middle. It's not the practice of suppressing symptoms. That's, uh, that's not real medicine. And we, we look at the energetics of food. So we have the yang and the yin, of course. <clears throat> the yang is the warmth and the yin is the cooling. Now we could have taken the words alpha and omega bing and bong we could do whatever you know any words we wanted to but we've chosen these um, Chinese words and so without it being too mystical it's just words showing the polarity there and the energetics of food is really interesting especially when you spend a lot of time in this Nordic cold climate and then you switch to a warmer climate you feel a, a different kind of energy and you had different kinds of foods you want and then, of course, personal experience confirms this polarity. Like, I'm, I'm not here telling you this because I've been excited about this intellectually for all these years. I have confirmed this many times through my personal experience that this is really the way it goes. <clears throat> this is uh, another expression of yin and yang. Now, I wrote a book in German that sold nine editions. It was quite a popular book. Um, and... Um, 
um, the graphics department of the publisher read my book and I talked about grains having a firm yang energy and sprouts showing the opposite, a, a lighter kind of yin energy. And uh, there's a little bit of each one and the other, just like men have female hormones and, and the other way around, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a black and white issue. Uh, so the graphics department actually made this. They actually got those grains to cooperate and make a dot on those sprouts. They told me it was quite a feat. They took several attempts before they got it. But uh, <clears throat> this book came out in 1989. In Germany, books come out two times a year. And uh, this was selected as the best cover of the books that came out in Germany for the spring editions of 1989. <clears throat> So it was quite, quite a, an honor for them to, uh, to get that. I thought it was really great uh, you know, to, have, to have them read the book and then make the, the title uh, cover uh, out of what the, I had written rather than just you know, putting some colorful vegetables on there like you'll see often. So we're, we're gonna start with the basics here and that's the vagus nerve. Now, some of you, are I'm sure aware of the vagus nerve. It's the largest nerve in the body connecting the brain with the gut. And about 80% of the ener energy flowing in the vagus nerve is going actually from the gut to the brain. Until a few years ago, it was assumed that it's the other way around. And of course, science always turns out to have it wrong somewhere. And they now they've corrected that. But we have 500 million nerve cells in our gut. And the gut health is what really will decide the biochemistry and the signaling that goes to the brain. So in other words, if you're going to have a proper brain function, you need to have harmony in the gut. And this is not a revolutionary statement, but it's missed by most people. Uh, we tend to fraction things and even most people that deal with psychology have not understood this. In fact, they've gone the way of the conventional medicine of just prescribing uh, medications for people for you know antidepressants and antipsychotic drugs and it's the wrong way it just doesn't lead to any success so we have a gut brain as it's called also the second brain and it's a crucial factor for the condition of the head brain which is what we normally think of as brain now 50 percent of the dopamine and 90 percent of the serotonin uh, are made in the gut. Now, these are the uh, uh, signal signaling uh, substances that are sent, the neurotransmitters, they're called. And food, of course, is the key to gut health. Now, if we come back into the uh, oriental essence here, we have uh, Jing and Shen. Now, Jing is the yang essence. This is like uh, food we eat. It's also our genetic background, but we don't need to talk about that because there's nothing we can do about that. But the other part of Jing is what we do every day with our food choices. And so the, the Jing essence of the, of the body, this is our chi energy. It, there's the yang essence Jing, and then there is the Shen. And the Shen, we have meditation, breath, like just uh, in the previous presentation, we had a nice... Uh, in, encounter with the meditation and breath of the Shen, the, which is located in the heart, whereas Jing is located in the kidneys, according to Chinese understanding. So food feeds the nervous system, and it, that's what allows spirit. We cannot have any kind of mental abstract thought and projections unless we have a functioning nervous system. Just thinking about what blood sugar issues do with people uh, already makes us understand how close that goes. When people get blood sugar problems, they can't concentrate, uh, they can get irritable, uh, depressed, because the cells that are making our body run, they need glucose to run. And when the blood sugar is not there, those organ functions start shutting down or getting disturbed. Now, the first two systems of an embryo developing in the womb are the digestive and nervous systems. And this is a, uh, a typical macrobiotic model for understanding how closely they're related. So the yin and the yang. Now I've chosen the yin and yang with the purple, violet, and, and the red because on the scale of the colors, 
they they go from the most yin color, which is violet, to the most yang color, which is red. In the middle, we have yellow, like the yellow emperor, the the emperor of the middle. So I, I bring those up because there's an energy in those in those colors. And this, of course, is something that makes the subject of abortion so interesting because the question is, when does life begin? Like, is is life really only begin to say week twelve? Uh, obviously not. You know, the, it's already going there. And uh, the, this is if we allow this process to uh, further develop, this will become a human being. And because it all starts with these two energies of digestive system, which we see the, the reddish in the middle there, that's the kind of the digestive system, and then the nervous system, that our whole life, there is a interconnection here between these two. And I'm sure everyone can follow me on this because... Um, for example, if you fast, that means you're not putting any energy into your digestive system. This frees that energy for uh, for the nervous system, and uh, you know many religions have fasting traditions. To you know Christianity, Judaism, uh, even the, the Ramadan thing of the Muslims. Uh, the, there's an idea that when you fast, you're going to do something to improve your ability to grasp religious thought. So now we come to leaky gut, which triggers illness. Now, Professor Fasano from Harvard University was the first person to uh, actually coin this leaky gut back in the 90s. And uh, you know, a very intelligent man. And at the time it was rejected. And now, of course, today it's a very basic fact that leaky gut is the cause of most illness when it comes down to it. And we'll talk about why that is. Uh, because uh, with leaky gut, we no longer have a protective mucosa in our gut lining. And so very inflammatory substances get into the blood and create a lot of inflammation in the body. Now, one of the big problems is alpha gliadin. Alpha gliadin is what we normally understand as wheat gluten. In the 70s, a hybrid wheat was introduced. You can read an interesting book by Dr. William Davis called Wheat Belly. It gives you the background of this, but to make a long story short, alpha gliadin is very rough on the gut. And when I began macrobiotics in the early 70s, I never met anybody who was having trouble digesting glutinous grains. And today, gluten free is the buzzword. You know, I've, I've even seen uh, mineral water claiming to be gluten free. You know, that's how far we've come with that one. And so, what happens if there's a, a a biochemical signal called uh, zonulin, which creates gaps in the intestinal lining so that food particles can get through. This is where our nutrition comes from. But when we have alpha gliadin, it tends to get uh, chaotic and it creates bigger gaps. And then food is allowed through that shouldn't get through. And this is going to trigger inflammation. So we have to get it back in order. So my first concrete suggestion to you is don't eat wheat. Just don't eat it. Don't have it once a year for fun. You know, if you have any kind of gut issues. Now the, the lining of the gut uh, is renewed every three or four days. It's the most regenerative part of our bodies. So we don't have to have a, an, a fear of, of wheat. Uh, I, I eat it now and then you know, if I'm invited somewhere or some special thing, but I know that within a few days I'll recover. But if someone comes to me and, with problems and I can see that the gut is part of that problem and we have facial body diagnosis and macrobiotics to help us see those kind of digestive issues by looking at the face and elsewhere, that uh, these people, I would say, be very consistent and don't eat wheat. In fact, wheat has caused so much problems that people should even if they've got these kind of digestive issues for a while, avoid other glutinous grains, which are normally harmless. That would be spelt and rye, especially, but also barley. But there are other things that work fine, like buckwheat has no uh, gluten, and of course, rice, you know, my favorite, uh, quinoa, millet. There are plenty of uh, grains, things to choose from. Uh, just don't take wheat. So the uh, 
the problem with milk, of course, is that it comes number two after wheat. And milk is in some ways a worse problem because everybody thinks you have to have milk to get enough calcium unless you're informed. And those of us who are informed know that it's all nonsense. Uh, actually, people get sick from taking milk. In fact, a very good book you might be interested in by Dr. Thomas Levy is called Death by Calcium. And he makes a very good case. He's a cardiologist. Um, he makes a very good case for uh, the effects of excess calcium on, on causing death. And so you have this ironic situation of uh, people almost panic that they won't get enough calcium and they're actually getting sick from too much of it. So it's best to just avoid cheese, et cetera. You know, this is a standard macrobiotic uh, uh, recommendation. Then we come onto the subject of glyphosate. Now I can't get into all that, you know, glyphosate itself, I could talk for half an hour about, but we'll just say it's uh, well known as Roundup. It is a very toxic uh, herbicide. In other words, it, it will kill weeds. And uh, we all know the story of Monsanto, I'm sure, but it harms the microbiome. Glyphosate was actually developed as an antibiotic. and and that's what it does. It destroys the microbiome, which is the gut bacteria culture. So what this says, concrete, is eat as much organic food as possible. Now, unfortunately, the U.S. is uh, the big consumer of glyphosate. Here in Europe, they have it, but they, they have a more cautious approach to it. But as we all know, in the U.S., it's uh, anything goes. Then we have a chlorine and fluoride, which uh, also added to the drinking water in the US especially. Now here in Europe, uh, very few countries have it. Ireland fluoridates the water, but most countries don't do it because it's very toxic. But again, in the US it's, you know, whatever. And uh, it uh, creates a lot of problems for the gut. So already people have a very damaged condition there. And these sets off autoimmune responses. And it makes uh, a lot of severe inflammation. And we've seen the, it's, all, it's a proportional thing. The more inflammation you have in your body, the stronger you're going to react to COVID. Now, all four of my daughters got COVID and all four of them just experienced like having a cold uh, because their bodies are inflamed. Fortunately, my four daughters uh, have, uh, as grown women, have uh, adopt, you know, kept the things they did as a kid as a, uh, their food guidelines and so they don't eat sugar and they don't eat dairy food and uh they they didn't have a problem with it well here's they say you know a picture's worth a thousand words here we have what we have on the left tight junctions that's the way your gut lining should look and on the right leaky gut is where this happens we have gluten microorganisms toxins uh too many big food particles getting through those gaps getting into the blood causing igg iga reactions, and then the, uh, the reaction of the immune system with the B and T cells. So that's all, all you know, very complicated stuff uh, to talk about. So we'll just go right on because we do have a time limit here, but uh, it shows you what we're doing here. So here are some stalwarts of the macrobiotic um, kitchen. I just want to bring those in now because this is the way you heal the gut. You know, if we had the problem, here's the solution. Uh, miso, making a miso soup. That's what it looks like if you haven't tried that before. Umeboshi, my favorite. I have some of that every day. Kuzu. And an ume kuzu drink is the way you can actually heal leaky gut and the many other problems. And I would recommend everybody to have that at home as a first aid preparation thing, if, if nothing else. Uh, kuzu is a, is a thickener. You know, you can use it making a sauce. You don't have to just use it in these special drinks. Uh, but the, the Ubi Kuzu drink is one of the standard macrobiotic uh, home remedies, and uh, it's worth getting to know that. So food is the best medicine, and I'm sure I have a lot of people agreeing me with that of this group. Uh, and so we're restoring the microbiome to where it should be and so that it thrives. Now, one of the important things also here, con another concrete suggestion is eat as much variety as possible because we have hundreds of different kinds of gut bacteria and they have preferences for different kinds of food. So if we always eat the same food, we'll have very limited uh, uh, spectrum of gut bacteria. We won't do so well. So as much as possible, change things around different legumes like beans, chickpeas, lentils, 
Um, and uh, it was interesting here, they were talking about the it, rapid increase in price of food right now. People can't afford meat. And someone said people are going to have to eat more lentils, you know, and I found that interesting because it's actually right, you know, uh, people who not only are interested in having a better microbiome, uh, but just ha that have enough food on the table will be looking more at these kinds of foods in the future, I'm sure. So you chew well, you eat relaxed, and um, also intermittent fasting, which is the buzzword at the moment, intermittent fasting, which is having a gap you know, between the meals, like eating twice a day instead of three times a day is what it comes down to. Uh, that allows the body to recover and regenerate during those hours when you're not eating anything. <clears throat> then you support the, uh, the detox, the lymph, liver, and then the bowel. I mean, this whole system is uh, like, uh, like a funnel. And the lymph system is everywhere and everything funnels through the liver. So take good care of your liver. And then you'll be sure your bowel function is ordered because that's the way you detox. And if you get constipated, the whole thing shuts down. Your liver cannot detox properly. The lymph system can't detox and you are in trouble. And with the right food, bowel problems and constipation just uh, are uh, not an issue. Then other anti-inflammatories are seaweed, fish, nuts, olive oil, coconut oil, ginger, and turmeric. Uh, other things that are good, cod liver oil, vitamin D, omega-3, the DHA and EPA. Uh, that are in uh, cod liver oil. So we have you know, uh, both the vitamin D and the omega-3. And then uh, the major inflammatory issues we avoid. So sugar, wheat, milk, meat, canola oil, also called rapeseed oil, omega-3 cooking oils, and the nightshades. Macrobiotics is very, uh, very good that way. Not many ways of uh, eating uh, include the nightshades uh, because they are uh, a sickness factor. And so instead of potatoes, you can take cauliflower, instead of eggplant, mushrooms, instead of bell peppers, celery, instead of uh, tomatoes or tomatoes, as they say in Australia and England, uh, beets. And um, instead of pepper, you can take ground black pepper, which is not a nightshade. But if we understand that illness is an inflammation and Alzheimer is a brain inflammation, then it's quite obvious that we want to uh, reduce inflammation. And that means cut out the nightshades. I've seen many times, this is the biggest stumbling block for many people. They just cannot stop eating tomatoes. So this is pretty basic stuff. Yang is the dense energy, yin is the expansive energy. So we're, you know, we're thinking of that when in our food selections and then the balance of yin and yang, this is food for body and mind. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with what I've got here. You know, we've got at six o'clock, we got the beans, which are uh, the protein. It's good to have some protein in the meal. Um, you know, and then at nine o'clock there, we've got some seaweed, uh, very important for all kinds of uh, reasons, but if this is really a great food and, uh, just makes you feel good. It's not just something to fill your belly. It's something that makes you feel like you're in balance with, uh, with the whole natural order. So fibrous whole grains and vegetables are the basis. I'm sure many of you uh, are not uh, learning anything new here. This is pretty well known. Uh, one thing that not everyone does is soaking before cooking because the phytic acid is a problem. Now, if you read my bio, you will have read that I worked in a clinic in Germany for several years as a food consultant. Uh, actually, it was a macrobiotic food program that we called Vitalkost in German, which is vitality food. And um, uh, it was uh, interesting to uh, uh, start that program before I'd actually understood the importance of soaking. So we would have about 10% of our patients would not be able to tolerate whole grains. And then I began to really understand the soaking issue. And we started soaking all the grains. And then we had just rarely that someone uh, could not eat the whole grains. It was uh, quite a change. So you chew them well and you eat only when you're relaxed. Now, many are already uh, aware of the polarity of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic is what we call the fight or flight. The parasympathetic is everything else. It's a relaxed state. So like if you 
wake up at night and you think there's a, a burglar breaking into your house, you go into total sympathetic mode. In other words, how do I deal with this danger? Uh, you wouldn't, your, your body wouldn't be thinking about uh, digesting food or, you know, anything else. Uh, your immune system would not be uh, charged for dealing with virus because everything right now is survival. So we, we should have about 95 to 98% of our nervous system activity should be parasympathetic in a relaxed state. But unfortunately, with many people, it's the other way around. It's, uh, they're in a constant sympathetic state. Now, there's an easy way you can find out this. If you look at your hand and feel if it's sweaty, because a sweaty hand shows that you're in an overly sympathetic state. And people who drink coffee have always got sweaty hands. So unfortunately, um, uh, coffee is considered more of a, a cavalier sin and macrobiotics, but it's actually quite a, uh, a burden on the body when you're trying to uh, recreate uh, your original state of health. So, you know, no one drinks coffee to relax. They, they drink coffee because they want to be in that sympathetic state of awareness and now watch out and, you know, get things done. But we want to relax and we want to have the parasympathetic activated. Now, carbohydrates raise tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and this uh, makes it possible to create serotonin, which creates the calm state. And this is what we want to have. Now, protein raises the tyrosine, or it, uh, it, the tyrosine level, and then uh, promotes the pr uh, production of dopamine, which uh, we, the Chinese call Xi. Xi is like uh, uh, this spirit, of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get this done, you know, nothing's going to stop me. Uh, that's a go get them kind of attitude. So we need both. But uh, if serotonin is lacking, then, you know, we'll go towards depression uh, or uh, aggression it can go both ways. If it goes yin, it will become depression. If it's more excessive yang, it becomes aggression. So what you want is the perception, which is the yin part, and then the action to do things. So we need both of those. So beans, uh, of course, you know, that's nothing new there, but they're, they're important. They're fibrous. We need fiber because fiber is the food for the gut bacteria that make health possible. That's the problem with ketogenic food. At the moment, ketogenic is really popular among young people. In fact, I, I took part in an online uh, nutrition conference recently. It was in German. And at the... Uh, at the registration that said, uh, uh, there was this thing, what kind of food program do you follow? And so there were about eight different things and none of them were macrobiotic, of course. It was ketogenic and vegan and you know all these other things. And so then uh, under other, I wrote in macrobiotic because it seems like, you know, it's like an older generation kind of thing apparently. But the problem with uh, this uh, young hip keto thing is that you have to be very careful about you may not get enough fiber because fiber is only in carbs there's no fiber in protein or in um, fat so that's a good argument for uh, you know still eating those whole grains and the legumes so the uh proper preparation is important and that's why it's good to have some basic understanding of cooking i always very much appreciate all the cooking teachers that help out with this because you don't get anywhere without understanding how to do this properly. Uh, combo seaweed or kelp, both good uh, cook with the beans to increase digestibility. If someone thinks, you know, that they can't get away from uh, 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 gas and indigestion flatulence without it, you know, they, without stopping, then they'll just stop eating the the legumes, no matter how good they are. The modest amount of protein is also good for kidney health. That's where our Jing energy resides. And um, at the age of 70, which is already behind me, only the average person in the modern world only has 50% of the kidney function left. So we can see why uh, we were given by nature two kidneys, because by the time we reach the end of life, 
we've really whacked down our kidney function and we project we protect our chi energy by eating warming foods if it's cold so here we get into the uh the energetics of food so pr this is protein for the future these are different kinds of uh, uh pulses or legumes animal protein should be a secondary source of of protein not the major source as is uh, common fish and eggs are compact and more balanced yang red meat is very strong yang and then fowl comes next uh, chicken and turkey and that fermented vegetables um, uh, give a nice balance uh, with yin to the uh, animal food so i uh, i eat fermented vegetables at every meal but i tend to eat a larger amount of them if i have fish which is most of my animal protein also, the gut bacteria they found uh, is um, more favorable to health if you have fish as your animal protein as opposed to meat, because a different kind of harmful bacteria culture uh, builds up when people eat meat every day. But fish is neutral. Uh, excess protein creates over acidity. That's pretty clear. Uh, avoid dairy fire products. You know, that's that's really clear. Uh, I don't think I have to say too much more about that. If you eat dairy food, this gets into the lymph fluid. I won't go into why this is about because time's short here, but there's a very logical explanation of why uh, the more milk products you take, the more sludged your lymph fluid will become. And that's the beginning of your detox system, you know, going down the liver and the gut. So bad news. And if it gets toxic, the body becomes very vulnerable to illness. In fact, we saw with the COVID deaths that 93% of the deaths from COVID were people who had two or more comorbidities. In other words, they already were sick with other illnesses and their bodies are already inflamed. Then we just put on some more information on top of it and then it's too much for the body. Now, Michael Pollan is, uh, many people know, a fantastic fellow. And he really brought it down to one good quote which i actually uh, i quoted this in my book he said e eat real food in other words don't eat this you know meat uh, uh out of the lab or the stuff that's becoming popular now eat mostly plants not too much well, there it is real food mostly plants not too much now here's the time needed to di to digest food and you'll see why uh like fish uh, 30 minutes as opposed to pork four and a half to five hours so the longer meat takes to digests the more it will putrefy in the body you can imagine a piece of meat leaving it out at 37 degrees celsius which is uh the well, fahrenheit is 98.6 um uh, if you had a piece of meat sitting out on a counter at that summer heat temperature what that's going to be like after four or five hours uh you want the food to go through faster so whether we eat meat or not is a personal choice, but pork should be on everyone's avoid list, no matter what they eat. So Wu Wei is the order of the nature. And uh, so on the left, we have Wu Wei, and on the right, we have the, the uh, let's say the opposite of Wu Wei. It's where people thinking that uh, the milk of a cow, which is actually made for the nutritional needs of a calf, are actually right for the human being. And a lot of people believe that. In fact, in my book, I wrote two chapters about this subject because I get so many uh, questions and so much resistance about it. One is about calcium issue and the other is about the milk itself. So caffeine weakens. I just mentioned that earlier, but uh, I have found that a lot of people uh, just don't want to stop uh, taking caffeine. So it's important to understand that you just have to get away from it if you want to go forward in your health. Now, you may have a cup of coffee now and then with friends, get together with them. But if you need caffeine in the morning to get started, you have problems. Caffeine is the world's most popular psychoactive drug. It starts with Coca-Cola in childhood and goes right on up. And uh, I've watched a lot of people do health things. I see how other people present uh, health issues. And I'm always amazed when people are presenting their programs if they start touching on the caffeine issue, they'll almost become apologetic, saying, now, now it's all, of course, it's okay to drink coffee now, you know, but just don't drink too much. 
that you can feel this fear that people are going to just shut down and leave you listen to them anymore because uh, you just don't touch this subject. But there's a lot of reasons not to do it. And decaf has some caffeine. I get this question all the time. Or oh, then I'll have decaf. Decaf just means caffeine reduction, not caffeine removal. So the morning caffeine hit, we all know that. People have to have that. And uh, if you need this, you're in trouble. You should be able to wake up in the morning feeling good, being aware. Now, I'm especially interested in this subject because Finland and Sweden are the coffee drinking champions of the world. And recently I had a woman here in Stockholm come for a counseling session with me. And I said, no, you got to get rid of the, the, the coffee in the morning. She says, well, how do you wake up? I asked, how do you wake up? I wake, I open my eyes, and I get out of bed, and I'm awake, and I just get into the day. That's, that's how I wake up. So seaweed is important. I get a lot of questions about contamination. Now, seaweed doesn't swim around like a fish does. So we know very clearly a seaweed grows in a certain amount of, uh, in, in a, a certain place and has a certain amount of contamination. There's contamination everywhere in the air. So nowhere in the world is it free of contamination. But when you get seaweed from um, good sources, it's not an issue. And, uh, you know, I've done hair analysis and other things to see that I, I do not have uh, uh, any uh, heavy metal problems. But seaweed is really important for uh, recovering from any kind of illness, rich in iodine. Most people have too little iodine. If you don't eat seaweed, you should take uh, something like on the skin, like Lugol's. Uh, so you have to do something to get iodine because uh, we just don't have enough. They do iodized salt, but that's just not going to do it. Uh, kombu, wakame are two of the most important seaweeds because they're brown seaweeds and they, they help with uh, detoxing, especially radiation. But all seaweed is good, of course. And the sodium alginate in the brown seaweed is um, especially good for detoxing and seaweed gives a nice balance of the yin and the yang. So there it is, seaweed, the food of the future. Beautiful stuff. So there's a call to action and that is, we're already hearing about a new variant of, of the, the virus. And it should be clear to everyone that this is just a never ending thing. You know, if we're going to just try to avoid, or, you know, whatever people are doing, that if you have a properly functioning body and immune system, then it doesn't matter which variant comes along. This, the body is made by nature to deal with all possible viruses and variants of these viruses. If you've got a belly that looks like this, you've got what's called fatty liver disease. In fact, now it's even called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if your belly hangs like that, you can be sure that you have fatty liver disease. About one third of the U.S. population has got this, and uh, Europe's not far behind. Um, this is not the kind of condition for dealing with a future of uh, infectious disease. So by following the right food, you know, you can be rid of that fatty liver in a month. I've seen people with uh, even worse than this I haven't gone in, in four to six weeks. So you just have to make those changes if you haven't made them. And if you've already made those changes, you just think about, is there some way I can improve? So now I wanted to uh, switch gears here and uh, just give you my take on what you can do if you've had the jab or you know people who uh, are facing this uh uh, this challenge because uh, they either had to or they thought they should. And then afterward, they're hearing about the side effects of this. So here are some important things to think about. If, if you know someone who's had the jab, first of all, blood clots are the most pressing danger after you've had the, the jab. And in a set of white, <laughs> that should have been YL instead of LY there. I uh, made a mistake when I typed that. In acetylcysteine is um, a, an amino acid, and this helps to break up blood clots. So it's called NAC, 
and in Sweden, it's easily available in a health food shop. And I read recently when it, when it came out that this was good for stopping blood clots, the uh, FDA, this corrupt agency in the US, Food and Drug Administration, they immediately wanted to ban it. You know, as soon as something comes out, this helps. Okay, we've got to ban that because you know we, we want to control everything. And it's really perverse because it's a totally harmless thing. You're not going to harm yourself at all. Uh, and uh, I've, I've told Americans uh, uh, to uh, stock up on it while you still can, because who knows when they'll, on a whim, uh, ban it. And uh, it is the precursor to uh, glutathione, which is the body's most precious antioxidant. So that shows you why it's so this uh, cysteine is one of the uh, components of uh, glutathione. And we all need glutathione. Then to deal with the spike proteins, which are very toxic, and your body's been programmed to produce, produce these. Uh, there's something called fulvic acid, also humic acid, which uh, actually will break that down. I mean, what it does, it encapsules it and makes it totally harmless. So it will remove it without any problem. So the number one way to deal with spike protein uh, toxicity is to take fulvic humic acid, which you should be able to get uh, well, get it online if you don't get it in the uh, organic food store. Also, to break down spike proteins, you've got proteolytic enzymes. Now, uh, you can have these uh, like uh, from uh, pineapple or from papaya. Also, serapeptase is good or any kind of protease. Protease, you know, is that ASE means it's an enzyme. So this is like these are enzyme enzymes that break protein down. So if you've got a spike protein, it's only logical that an enzyme breaking, uh, a protein breaking enzyme will be good to get rid of spike proteins. The only question here is how much do you take? Now, for general purposes, for digestive purposes, it's enough, let's say one or two a day as uh, they're in capsules is recommended. If you're dealing with the aftermath of the jab, you would want to take five to 10 times, depending on your budget. And uh, then we've got other things like vitamin C, which you uh, would uh, take as a combination of ascorbic acid and ascorbate, and then include the bioflavonoids. In other words, you have kind of berry powder, like blueberry powder or uh, uh, acerola berries or uh, camu camu. There's all kinds of uh, high bioflavonoid uh, natural uh, substances that will uh, complement the vitamin C, which is basically a synthetically produced vitamin. And it's much more effective if you combine that with the bioflavonoids. Also, non-inflammatory um, substances like omega-3, which is in cod liver oil or fish oil, krill oil very effective for slowing down inflammation because uh, there's inflammation that comes about because of this, uh, the jab. Uh, vitamin D3. Now there are 140 studies, peer reviewed studies that show very clearly that your vitamin D3 level will determine how sick you get from the uh, coronavirus. And it's outrageous that this has not become common knowledge. The money that could have been saved if they had passed out vitamin D3 to people instead of all this other stuff, they could forget about the masks and the whole thing, the, 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 the injections with this experimental stuff. I mean, it's just total madness. Then we've got turmeric, which contains curcumin, also very good as inflammatory. It needs a bit of pepper. So some of the turmeric supplements already include the pepper. If they don't, add a little bit of black pepper to that. And then for detox, we got the classic bentonite clay, zeolite, um, vitamin B complex, including by B5. B5 is not always included uh, in the B complex. Chlorella, these are all helpful. Then B pollen, which is nature's multivitamin and mineral supplement. So B pollen is a great way to just generally make yourself stronger. There was a study done at the uh, University of Vienna in Austria where they uh, had uh, women who'd had uh, uh, radiation treatments for ovarian cancer. And some of them got B pollen, others didn't. And they found that uh, the group getting B pollen had much less uh, 
damage to the body from the radiation. It's you know, a very clear subject. And then minerals like zinc, magnesium, and selenium. Now, I've never taken a selenium supplement because I eat seaweed every day. So I have absolutely no need for it, but almost everyone's got a selenium deficiency. In fact, at the clinic I worked in Germany, every cancer patient got selenium supplements when they walked through the door because the doctors assumed if you've got cancer, you've got a selenium deficiency. So there was some rub when I would tell the patients that if you're going to eat seaweed, you don't need the <laughs> selenium supplements. It didn't make me very really popular with the doctors. So that's it. So thanks for your interest. And if you want to contact me, uh, like you can uh, order the book through me. Uh, there's my email address. And after that is my website. And the website is in English, German, Swedish, and now going into Spanish is the newest edition. So with that, I'm going to uh, take myself out of that now and back we go to uh, real life here. So we got uh, enough time for some questions. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions come up here. Yes. Uh, Scott, I have a question. Okay. <clears throat> I've always been taught um, that zucchini is very yin and it's a nightshade. And yet on your chart, it seemed like it was an alternative to nightshades. Yeah, well, uh, zucchini is not a nightshade, first of all. So whoever said that doesn't understand what nightshades are. Uh, so that's okay. I mean, it's certainly true that it's yin. In fact, it's so yin that the only way that I like to eat zucchini is when it's had a yang uh, preparation, like baked in the oven with mustard, because it's got a very, um, say, almost uh, neutral taste. So I put... Uh, tamari and mustard on on uh, the zucchini and bake it then it's okay okay so if you have yellow squash in the same shape as the the zucchini but it's yellow would that be okay oh yeah sure okay thank you Stephen. um a lot of very very popular <clears throat> uh and very successful groups around the the world <clears throat> plant-based whole food people, uh, the Dr. Esselstyn group, that they have pods all over and they have magazines and uh, Chef AJ, who's a huge um, person on YouTube, they eat a, an incredible amount of nightshades. And I just don't understand, you know, how different, you know, um, groups can be so varying on this subject. I always know from macrobiotics that we avoided nightshades. Could you illuminate me a little bit? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, you see, people have different levels of being informed. Some people are well-informed, others are moderately informed, and others are poorly informed. And one of the advantages of macrobiotic perspective is that uh, we try to look at the whole picture. And so we'll always ask ourselves, what speaks for and what speaks against? And then we take a sum total of that. Whereas many people, uh, it's just like, well, potatoes are high in potassium, so let's eat potatoes. They say, well, is that the only criterion here? <laughs> is, <laughs> is whether the potassium, I'm good. there's all kinds of potassium sources, you know, like eat some uh, cucumbers, you know, they're high in potassium. Uh, or, or the best one is tomatoes. Um, yeah, we need tomatoes because of the lycopene, you know. Well, there's lycopene in watermelon and, you know, it's just, it's just silly stuff. So when you look at the whole picture, uh, there is no question that nightshades are inflammatory. Like that's, that's a very clear thing. And anyone who claims that they aren't just needs to inform themselves better. Um, in fact, I uh, recommended in my book that uh, people who have inflammatory illness, which I mean, a lot of illness is inflammatory, but especially like uh, joint inflammation, rheumatism, rheumatoid arthritis, now, in the clinic where I worked, we had a nightshade-free program, and our best results were with rheumatoid arthritic patients. And they stayed six weeks. And in six weeks, they were cured. You know, mm -hmm. cancer patients don't cure cancer in six weeks, but rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. do. And so I would tell the people now, if, you're, if you are curious about this, because when you come home, you know, it's going to be tomatoes and potatoes. Again, that's what everybody does. Then what you should do is... Um, for a week is eat as many potatoes and tomatoes as you can try to get have hash browns for breakfast not really do it up big and then 
see what happens. You know, now what you should do is be sure that your health insurance is paid up when you do this because you may, <laughs> you may need it. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've seen it happen in a much less dramatic way. People just start eating tomatoes a bit, not <laughs> excessively. And then they can feel that joint pain coming back. Now, if I had more time, I'd go into the biochemistry of why this happens. But it has to do with the anti-nutrients that the plants make. And these are inflammatory. And when we think that um, uh, the uh, purpose of healthy living is to reduce inflammation, because we've all got a bit of inflammation somewhere, then you want to stay away from anything that is inflammatory and nightshades are that. Now, what's also important, I think, to understand is how difficult it is for people to stop taking them. Because all nightshades and tobacco is a nightshade and all nightshades contain some form of nicotine. In the tomato and potato, it's called solanine. And I have seen the difficulty people have to stop eating this. And it reminds me of someone trying to stop smoking. It's just, it's just hard to hang in there. So, um, you know, if you, if you say, if I, if I can't just stop it, like, let's say I like to have um, carrots. And if someone said, don't eat carrots, they inflame your body and say, okay, I'll, I'll have parsnips or something else instead. But the drama that people go through when you tell them about tomatoes, it's like you're saying, you know, you have to separate yourself from your partner or, you know, <laughs> it's like you have to make some life changing decision here. Uh, it's all just silly, but this uh, hanging on, this dependence to it shows there's a problem. Uh, uh, Steve, Steve yeah. uh, uh, on, on, on that uh, note, uh, you, you said earlier that, uh, that the Alzheimer's uh, is uh, indicative of uh, a, a, a brain uh, uh, inflammation. Uh, inflammation. And uh, could, you, could you get into, into the relationship of the uh, of the uh, the diet, the uh, the tomato and the potato, with uh, with uh, with that. Yeah, well, these substances actually can uh, uh, penetrate the uh, blood brain barrier, the three B, as it's called. The three B it protects the brain because it's very uh, sensitive to environmental problems, or toxins and uh, burdens. This is one thing that makes the uh, COVID vaccination so dangerous because the spike proteins uh, do penetrate the 3B. And that means they get into the brain, they will inflame the brain. I'm sure my own personal opinion is we're going to see an epidemic of Alzheimer's from this vaccination like we can hardly even imagine at the moment. But you know, we'll leave that for another time. But what we do have is that uh, solanine, see solanine is a neurotoxin. It's actually it's the basic same substance that's used in biochemical warfare, just that it's in a much milder dose. And when these substances get in and start affecting the nervous system, it can do it in different ways. But the most direct way is whatever penetrates the blood brain barrier will cause inflammation. Just as one example, tinnitus. Tinnitus is a sign that the, blood, the brain is inflamed. So this inflammation is creating an illusion that a sound is going on because the inflammation is stimulating that part of the brain that receives uh, sound. And uh, I've seen this happen in some cases where people have had tinnitus and then they end up with Alzheimer's. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that there's a connection there. And, you know, you just have to just stop them. And uh, uh, it's just so difficult to get people to, to stop them that, uh, you know, that's why I take extra care. In fact, in the book, I've got a chapter called The Dark Side of Nightshades uh, because I've got an extra chapter on caffeine, uh, nightshades, the, the milk, these things that people don't want to give up. And uh, so I mean, it's, a, it's a big subject, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the nightshades are definitely inflammatory and anyone who uh, takes them will find that if, you're, if your body is fairly good at neutralizing them, you can, you can get them without any uh, overt problems. So I'm not saying that everybody who eats them will get brain inflammation, but there are many causes of brain inflammation. And this is one of those factors. And especially for people who are dealing with uh, some kind of inflammatory illness or even uh, the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, 
uh, will be very well advised to steer clear of nightshades. And it was, you know, a great, uh, uh, I would say, achievement of uh, George Osawa, the man who brought macrobiotic teachings to us in the West, that he already back in that time was uh, talking about the nightshades. You know, hardly anyone was, and uh, there wasn't much interest in the scientific part of it. Let's take you, questions uh, from Yoki and Erica. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah do, you do you, when you soak your grain, do you throw out the soaking water or do you? Oh, yes. It? Yeah, throw out the soaking water. Throw it also, out. Okay. Yeah, okay. also because you may have heard the, uh, the bad news about arsenic in rice. And uh, when you soak the rice, uh, the uh, arsenic actually uh, will leach into the soaking water. So you want to get rid of that first. And then if you have a little bit of extra water, when you boil it up, just at the time it's boiling up, you uh, skim off the top, like there'll be a little bit of kind of scum that comes, just skim off some of that water because it will release the rest of that arsenic uh, just at the moment of boiling up. So I was watching an interesting BBC program called uh, uh, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor with Dr. Michael Mosley. And uh, he just answers questions that the viewers have sent in. And so they said, I've heard that rice has got an arsenic problem. What can we do about it? Well, so in London there, they take the rice off to the lab there and they check it out. They measure it for arsenic. They soak the rice throughout the soaking water, boil it up and take out some of that boiling up water. And when they checked the rice for arsenic after all this, there was an 80% reduction in the amount mm -hmm. of arsenic. So if you got good rice like Lundberg, which has got only yeah. a fraction anyway compared to other rice, and then you soak it and then you take a little bit of that excess water off when it boils up, then you won't have a problem. I've done a hair analysis and I had zero uh, arsenic problem after 50 years of brown rice. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> great to see you again. <laughs> yes, you too. <laughs> How time flies. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, Yoki has been waiting with her hand up, so let's just uh, oh. ask her. Here? Hello, Yoke? Stephen. Oh. Um, sort of really delicate sweetness. And we know that brown rice syrup is a glucose-based sweetener that's complex sugars. So it's actually a sweetener that's good for us. Uh, uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Uh, acoustically, I'm having a little trouble understanding. Are you uh, close to the microphone there? This is uh, black rice. So black rice is called black forbidden rice. It's a Chinese rice that was eaten by the aristocrats. It's very high in protein, very high in minerals, particularly magnesium, which is good for keeping our nerves calm in the world we live in. So this is a really rich tasting rice without being actually rich. It's Skillet, a dry skillet and toast. I know it seems like a lot, but this is a really simple dish. And a lot of things can be happening while your rice is cooking. So you just kind of move the nuts around, and as soon as you can smell pistachios, they're done. So to put the thing together, here we go black rice cooked and cooled. So you want to make sure that it's cooled so that your dressing doesn't go off, right? If your rice is really hot, then the lemon in the dressing will taste bitter. Now we'll take some fresh mint. You can use parsley or basil, but mint is going to balance with the lemon and give us an amazing flavor as well as be great for digestion. Yeah, well, I'm a great fan of black rice. Uh, it, it's all part of the, uh, the overall strategy to have as much variety in uh, cooking as possible, uh, your food choices. Black rice is good. I like red rice too. And uh, you know, I've never been I've never been concerned about uh, any kind of contamination in seaweed or rice or anything else because part of it is the question is what what's in the food. The other is do you eat seaweed as well because seaweed contains sodium alginate which draws toxins out of the body. And I think that's why my hair analysis came out so well, because I, uh, there's hardly a day goes by that I don't eat seaweed. And it's uh, quite often uh, the brown seaweeds that are the ones with the uh, sodium alginate. Uh, Yoke, I think you're next. 
Hello, Stephen. Um, Hello. The uh, about uh, the rice and um, does that also count for organic rice? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because the uh, the rice is looking for silica, and silica and arsenic are very close. So, if there's any arsenic in the ground at all, uh, the rice plant will absorb it. However, most of the arsenic is not in the actual grain; it's in the plant. So it's actually not a problem. They think like Asians eat uh, 12 times more rice than Westerners do, and arsenic contamination is not a problem in Asia. So the whole thing, I mean, it's, it's really pretty silly. You have people that are eating glyphosate contaminated food, and uh, they're concerned about arsenic, but you don't hear anybody complaining about the glyphosate, which is a real issue. Uh, you know, and uh, but this is the way it goes. You have big business uh, with their influence on the media and the information we get. So you're always getting, uh, you know, a half the story and a distorted thing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just uh, eat well and, you know, it just takes care of itself, really. And about the omega-3 from fish, um, there is a... Unfortunately, the fish is so polluted nowadays. Isn't it better to get the omega-3 and 6 from flax seeds? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. First of all, the omega-3 from flax seed is not real omega-3. It is uh, just the uh, precursor. So it still has to be changed. And unfortunately, the human body does not have the enzymes needed to do that efficiently. So we have somewhere between 5 and 10 to 12% of that uh, ALA, uh, which is the precursor, that will actually get transformed into the usable form of uh, omega-3. Right. But uh, you're on the right track there that if you are a vegan or you don't want to have it from the fish, uh, you can uh, take it from algae. There, there's an algae yeah. oil. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's a very good product, a very clean. You know, it's a, a, a grown that they have it in tanks and they and they do that well. Uh, if you do cod liver oil, which is where I get my omega-3 from, it is actually filtered. Uh, you know, if you've got a Norwegian, most of it comes from Norway. If you get a Chinese cod liver oil that's cheaper, you know, who knows what's in that. But uh, the Norwegians are very strict about that. So it goes through something called uh, uh, microfiltration. And mm -hmm. that's all removed. In fact, it also removes some of the vitamin D. So they actually add vitamin D to the cod liver oil because in the microfiltration, uh, some of it gets lost. And most vitamin D comes from sheep's wools. They just take this sheep's wool vitamin D, add it to the cod liver oil, and then they get it back up to, you know, where it should be. All right. Okay. And yeah, but then you've got your omega-3 anyway, that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Lena? Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Steve. Hello. Nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> and well to be recognized as usual. Um, yes, I'm... Listen, listen, I have um, um, the idea about soaking uh, almonds and nuts. If we talk about soaking, is this makes it any sense? What is what do we want if we soak the, the seeds and the nuts? before roasting them? Well, that's a good question. That's actually why I wrote the book. Uh, you know, I go, go into all this stuff because, you know, when people have a session with me, they walk out with their head spinning about all this soaking and all these things. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Of course, I got a 50 year head start on this, you know, and these people just being confronted with this stuff. Well, uh, as it turns out, seeds and nuts are actually the, the future of that plant. And the only way that a plant has any future is if it can make itself indigestible. So the, the seeds and nuts are loaded with what are called anti-nutrients. Now they're there to, to make us regret having chosen them as food. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, you know, to become indigestible, but in the end we're smarter than they are. So we can, we can do things to, to diffuse that. So by soaking, we draw those out. Now, if you add salt, to the water of seeds and nuts, then you get a really dynamic with removal of those substances. Just soaking is okay, but you soak in salt water, you really pull them out. And okay. you'll notice the biggest change is with walnuts, which have a, 
a slightly bitter taste. And when you've soaked them in salt water, they become sweet. Mm -hmm. Biggest, mm -hmm. biggest change of all of them. But Great. above all, they become more digestible. And yeah. like people who don't have a gallbladder anymore, you know, they're very sensitive to fatty things like nuts. And, uh, yeah. you know, gallbladder operation is the most common operation that's done. So a lot of people without a gallbladder running around. And um, when they have these uh, pre-soaked uh, mm -hmm. seeds and nuts, just much easier to digest. Then after the soaking, you have to dry them if you're going to store them. Otherwise, they will mold. You so have either, to roast them, I thought, not to roast yeah. them in the pan. Mm -hmm. That's right. So your choices are to do a little bit every day that you eat that day before they can mold, or you do a large amount and dry them. Now, I have a food dryer or dehydrator, as it's called. Oh, yeah. And so I do more at once, and then I just dehydrate them. In the summer, I like to put them out in the sun, you know, but uh, in Sweden here, uh, you, you can wait a long time for, <laughs> for enough, <laughs> enough heat in the sun to dry nuts. And so uh, it's a good idea to have a, a dehydrator. And then I keep those in a, a closed jar in the fridge. Oh, and okay. uh, that's, that's the way to do it. But you'll notice a big difference in digestibility when you yeah. uh, do that. And I mean, mm -hmm. when people come to my home, and they'll they go into the kitchen they see i've got grain soaking and i've got bean soaking i've got nuts and seeds soaking and everything soaking and <laughs> and uh you know like, you know this looks like a lot of work you know i say well you know how long does it take to pour water into a bowl and add add the nuts you know it's it's actually it's more being organized than than spending a lot of time doing that and uh, but it does make a difference because uh, you know the people do have problems digesting all of this food if they're getting all these anti nutrients and then they give up because they just don't digest it. So the, this kind of information we're talking about is really the key uh, to long term success. Super. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then my husband Kent. We know each other too. A question yeah. or several yeah. questions. Yeah, Steve. We met in Ludwigstein years ago for the first time. At a, a week, a week uh, seminar with macrobiotics, we met then. Yeah, can you yeah. Oh, can you I have great. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I have great uh, memories I, of the uh, those summer camps at the Burg Ludwigstein. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Yeah, really. <laughs> they were. It. Our, our experience was wonderful there. So I, I have a question. Um, because I have stents, I was given then aspirin to uh, prevent thrombosis and yeah, yeah. to, to uh, counteract the acidity of the uh, aspirin, I was given, I'm given pantoprazol. You may you know, you know that uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, a hem, it's hem, hem to, um, in German, well, the, the, the Magenbach Salziger Sefte in Magen is, is a hem. Yes, yeah. he, he stops the acidity yeah. in the stomach. And, and I think also the aspirin. So the thing is, on a long-term basis, there can be there can be side effects. So I have a question. The question is, is there a another kind of uh, blood thinner to be used instead of aspirin to prevent thrombosis? And I have one. I looked up one on the internet. It's it's uh, has a um, um, a French pine bark origin. It's called P I P Y C N O G E N O L psycho psychogenol. Yeah, if you know about it, you know about it. Yeah, that's but, right. Um, what do you think about um, an alternative for aspirin as a blood thinner? Well, I think you're smart that you're looking for an alternative because uh, first of all, aspirin works by uh, knocking out all eicosanoids in the body. Now, uh, one of the eicosanoids makes blood thicker. So, uh, so it knocks out not only the blood thickening it costs noise, but everything. So you're basically uh, putting your health at risk when you take aspirin very long. And if you follow the uh, news about medications as closely as I do, you know that uh, aspirin has got a bad uh, reputation in the last year yeah. or two. Yeah. The side effects. And as you say, one side effect leads to another medication. And so they have a, a good, <laughs> interesting German expression called <laughs> a rat's tail of consequences <laughs> and uh and so you get you know one thing so now you're taking the the stomach acid blockers and then that's going to cause you to have uh SIBO the uh, overgrowth of bacteria in your in your small intestines because you no longer have the 
stomach acid you need. Yeah. And the whole thing is absurd because first of all, omega-3 fatty acid is a blood thinner. What? It's a blood thinner. In fact, oh. it is called a contraindication. In other words, you're not supposed to take omega-3 fish oil or algae oil if you're taking a blood thinner because your blood will become too thin. Yeah. And of course, there's a reason why our blood gets thicker because we get bleed to death if we, you know, if, <laughs> if we get yeah. injured, we'll bleed to death if our blood can't be thicker. So there's first of all that one. And then a, a couple of other things are if you drink enough water, then yeah. your blood will constantly be thinner. But if people drink caffeine, caffeine is a dehydrator. It uh, flushes water out of the system. So your blood gets thicker when you drink coffee. But yeah. asking people to stop drinking coffee is too much. Let's just put, you know, put them on the medication. But it's, yeah. one thing is clear uh, that long-term aspirin is an invitation to big health problems. And so I would start with that. Now, there's, this is a, quite a, a, an interesting long term issue, so I can't really go into it too much because we have a, a time limitation here, but there are such things as insulin, uh, which also will, will create thicker blood. I mean, the, there's so many things you can do. And if you do, if you eat properly, you don't have to worry about having uh, too thick blood. You have blood that's just right because nature takes care of these things. But we do need to understand what we can take instead of medications when a doctor says, you know, you need to take this. Yeah. Because you definitely don't want to uh, block your uh, stomach acid because, I mean, I could sit, I could talk for an hour and what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. you do that, you know, and that's just an invitation to disaster. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, you may have seen my uh, email address there. What you can do is if you have any more questions about this, just send me an email and we'll uh, discuss yeah. this more online. Good. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you. Good. Maybe we can finish with Christian. Is, do I have your name right? That's right. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hello, Christian. Yes. I haven't seen you in 20 years. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow. So. It's just amazing that the, the people, I see them after all these years and see like how, how short life really is. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a short question, which is uh, when it comes to soaking, if there is any kind of investigation or behind the soaking time. Oh, wait a minute, somebody yeah. needs to do, uh, uh, Lena, would you uh, uh, mute yourself? I'm looking for them here. Here we yeah. go. Okay, now, Christian. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is different opinions about the soaking times. So, I mean, some recommend eight hours, some recommend 12 like Sally Fallon, she recommends 24 hours. So is there some kind of, uh, you know, research or science about how long time it takes to, to break down the fixinic acid? That's yeah. the question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's also uh, an important question. How long do you soak them? Um, Sally Fallon recommends, uh, and she's a really well informed about this soaking business. Uh, she recommends eight hours in salt water for seeds and nuts, but it can also be longer. Like I, sometimes I plan on doing something with them out eight hours and I just get something else going and I don't take them out for say 15 or 16 hours. And that's quite okay if they soak longer than you need to. But that's because the salt water is very quick in, in uh, removing the enzyme inhibitors. When you're talking about the whole grains then it's mostly the phytic acid you want to get rid of and their temperature really makes all the difference. In Germany, there is a university in the city of Gießen, which is north of Frankfurt, and that's sometimes called the, the Whole Foods University because their nutrition department is really into all this stuff. And so they did, uh, they did a study. They actually invited me to speak there a couple of times. And so they, uh, uh, they did an, a study of how much phytic acid remains. So they did in the winter at just room temperature in the kitchen, they soaked uh, oats, which are very high in uh, phytic acid. And uh, they added a little bit of uh, vinegar because the, uh, just the soaking itself doesn't, uh, does, doesn't uh, do it with oats because it doesn't have the phytase. That's another story. But anyway, they, they, uh, they did it at room temperature in the winter and then room temperature in the summer. And they found that uh, eight hours of soaking in the winter broke down 30% of the 
phytic acid, but in the summer, eight hours took 50% of the phytic acid. So generally we can say 24 hours is a good time for soaking to get rid of the phytic acid in general, uh, but it does depend on the temperature. Uh, so if you've got plenty of time, you're at home and you're well organized, you just always do it 24 hours before. If you come home from a trip or you know been away and you don't have that much time, you can still get a partial breakdown of, of uh, the phytic acid even in a shorter time. But by adding vinegar, now I say vinegar because it's cheaper than lemon juice, the price of lemons these days, but lemon juice will do this too. Uh, the vinegar or the lemon juice will accelerate the breakdown of phytic acid if you, if you don't have the 24 hour time to wait. And uh, the, uh, the, the uh, other issue is that uh, if you have uh, uh, a, um, if you have any kind of uh, fermented thing, like I make my own fermented vegetables. So I sometimes will add a little bit of the water that comes out of say uh, pickled cucumber and just add that too. And then you get this fermentation going there. But one of the, one of the issues is how much phytase is in the, the grain. So oats don't have much phytase. So you could, soak oats until the cows come home, as they say, and uh, there won't be much breakdown of the phytic acid because uh, soaking activates phytase. And so if you're dealing with rice or some other grain that has phytase, then the phytase is activated. Now, ACE means it's an enzyme, so it's the enzyme that breaks down phytic acid. So there, uh, 24 hours is all you need. Uh, uh, rye, has a lot of phytase. So, you know, like when you do uh, a sourdough rye bread, you really get rid of all the, the, uh, the phytic acid there. And that's probably why rye sourdough bread has been a popular European staple. Uh, then you have that situation, but with oats, you really need something to help it along uh, so that uh, it can do the job that phytase would do. And that's where the addition of uh, vinegar comes in. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, this sounds uh, really kind of complicated. When you've been doing it a little bit, it's really just like, you know, just easy stuff. But in the beginning, it's kind of a lot of information to take in. Well, Steve, I think we are, we have, um, we have an expression in Hebrew that we run you out or something. <laughs> you've been terrific. Yeah, it's really a pleasure. And I can see right away that we're going to have to, not have to, but we would want to invite you back if you have an opportunity, we'll find a, another chance to do that. Well, so it just remains for me yeah, to thank you. I really appreciate your knowledge and your willingness to share with us. It's really been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh Constipation is a big issue, and I'm, I just touched on that a bit during my uh, oh, yeah. presentation. That uh, uh, the whole detox uh, process goes out through the, uh, the the bowel, and if you get constipation, everything stops. So the liver can't work properly, the lymph system can't work properly, and then you get into big, big trouble. So it's absolutely important. So the the food normally works fine. When I worked in the clinic, we would have patients who would have a bowel movement once a week uh, for oh. years. And within two or three days of eating our food, uh, they would have normal daily bowel movements. It went that fast. But let's say if someone is, they, they're not willing to change their food, you know, children are not the most reasonable people in the world. <laughs> uh, uh, you can actually take high doses of vitamin C. I had uh, a woman I know in the U.S. sent me an email recently that she was getting desperate because she uh, she just could not get it going. And so I told her to take 20 grams of uh, vitamin C as a, a mixture of uh, ascorbic ascorbate, like uh, either sodium or magnesium ascorbate and uh, ascorbic acid. Take 20 grams. You have to take that at different times during the day because uh, it, you know, it... Uh, <laughs> It doesn't stay in the body that long. So see over three or four or more times a day, you take that. And she wrote me back already the next day. Boy, that did it. You know, that just sets everything going. In fact, 
when you determine how much vitamin C someone should take for like a cancer therapy, uh, you use what's called bowel tolerance to decide where the le level goes. That means when your bowel starts reacting, that means don't take any more. So uh, I remember one Ukrainian boy in Melbourne, Australia, who uh, like he was just, he was five years old and he had so much pain involved in a bowel movement that he would, he would just try to hold back and uh, his parents brought him and uh, it worked so fast that uh, in the, in the next couple of weeks, I had 11 Ukrainian families come, you know, they, these ethnic groups tend to hang out together and the word got around, this guy's got some solutions. I had 11 Ukrainian families coming with all kinds of things. And because of this one little boy who just like that, it just flipped in, in instantly. So I would say for children who are non, not cooperative, uh, go with the vitamin C and um, you know, like the amount of, child needs would be adjusted to an adult like if the child is half the size of an, of an adult then take half the dose of vitamin c so say take 10 grams instead of 20 grams you know like a, a teaspoon is about four grams so this is not that much like taking two and a half teaspoons of vitamin c in the course of a day thank you yeah even you had talked earlier about fluoride and chlorine um, is it does it, does it damage your your uh, body to be in a chlorinated pool? I know I don't do any fluoride toothpaste, but I'm having to be in a chlorinated pool a lot for aqua therapy. Yeah, that's right. It does damage because your skin will absorb it. Like you know, basically say, don't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't eat. You know, so when you read the ingredients in some moisturizing cream, and you can't even pronounce most of these these chemical terms say imagine eating a spoonful of that stuff well the it goes into your body and um uh so you uh, you know i ha i have not been in a chlorinated pool since uh 1971 <laughs> that was the year i discovered macrobiotics <laughs> and uh, i just uh do without uh the swimming if i can't get a, a something natural you know, I just, I just will not sub subject myself to that kind of uh, problem, you know, of absorbing all that chlorine, because it is very toxic stuff. And it, it's there to kill, kill bacteria, but it kills any bacteria, not just the, uh, the bad ones. Most bacteria are actually beneficial. So, uh, you know, if, if you have to do it, you know, because for some health reason, what I would do is, uh, put some kind of oil in my body, you know, like, you know, coat yourself in olive oil or something and then, and then get, get into the water because the, the, uh, the oil will, uh, you know, slow down the, the absorption, but, uh, you know, you might get into trouble with the people responsible for the <laughs> doing that. I don't know, but I, I myself would rather look for some other kind of, uh, solution than, uh, than uh, a chlorinated pool. Thank you. That's what's nice about salt water. Like I remember uh, I spent some wonderful times in uh, Miami there and going uh, swimming there in the, uh, the salt water. And of course the climate, you know, made the water so nice. And when I've, when I've been in salt water, my body just loves it. You know, it, uh, intuitively my body tells me a lot and uh, I, I can feel having that salt water on my skin, that's drawing the toxins out. It's actually turns the skin into a third kidney, as they call it in Chinese medicine. Are we actually out of questions? <laughs> Last chance. And I, I have a question. Uh, are you going this part of the uh, after the lecture, is that going to be on your website also, on a YouTube? In yeah. addition to the lecture, all these questions that are being answered by students. Yes. Okay, yes. they're great. I, this is yeah, wonderful. they are great. <laughs> yes. So then I came in on the uh, last part of your uh, your your discussion with the brown rice because I eat brown rice every day. Did you did I interpret you correctly saying that? I should soak my brown rice in uh, vinegar. 
for 24 uh, hours or not? No, it's a good thing you asked that question. That was uh, that was a misunderstanding. Uh, what I've said that if you're going to soak oats, then add vinegar because oats don't have phytase. So soaking isn't going to get rid of the phytic acid. You know, you have to okay. activate the phytase. So with rice, it's enough to uh, just soak it. But if you're going to eat oats, which is a very popular grain in Northern Europe because it grows well, you know, Scottish oat cakes and the whole thing. So uh, we, uh, we eat a lot of oats here and the, you don't get that much out of it. So there the vinegar will take care of that problem. But uh, for, for general rice, just soak it as normal. And, um, and then uh, of course, as the one question came about throwing out the water after the soaking, that's important because uh, some of the contaminants uh, will just go out in the soaking water. Thank you. Does that include steel cut oats also? I mean, I guess it would. Oh, yeah, sure. Because yeah, steel cut oats have just been chopped in the middle, you know, but uh, they've still got the, uh, the phytic acid. See, phytic acid is there for specific purposes, and oats are loaded with it. Okay. And uh, what kind of vinegar do you use? Uh, you can use any kind of vinegar, really, because you've got to throw out that water after. Uh, you know, however, I do take uh, unpasteurized uh, apple cider vinegar. It's my favorite because there's a certain enzymatic action going. So you get a bit, a little bit more powerful uh, vinegar action, I think, when you use something like that, even though it's more expensive than, say, a cheap vinegar. But, you know, you only need a teaspoon to a tablespoon for, uh, for, for a pot of oats. So it's not a major expense to have the good quality uh, apple cider vinegar. I have a question yeah, re regarding the nightshades. Yes. Um, I've been in macrobiotics for about 30 years and I remember a few people saying that because I live in Florida that it's not such a big deal because of the heat. Can you comment on that? Yeah, that's an interesting question because See, yin and yang are fascinating. And when I started macrobiotics, that's all I cared about because this was a totally new vision of how to do things. And then as time went by and I became a teacher, I discovered that uh, not everybody was ex interested in yin and yang like I was. And if people said, well, why shouldn't I uh, eat potatoes and tomatoes? And I say, well, because they have uh, excessive yin and people that, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, as if I'm from the moon or something, you know, who cares about that? You know, I like to eat them. And so I just naturally became interested in the biochemistry of the body and the, the chemical uh, questions that surround food. And so I started going through these things. And uh, so it became obvious to me why it's good to avoid them wherever you live. Now, if you're just going to look at yin and yang, and it's just an energy thing, nightshades are very yin. And in a yang climate like Florida or Southern California, Arizona, uh, there you're going to have the yang heat, which will give some kind of balance to them. And that's true. It, it does do something, but it just, I mean, I've had hundreds of people with rheumatoid arthritis over the years and uh, from every possible climate and everybody uh, has a great uh, benefit from avoiding them. So we would say, just cut them out. And, you know, the... I have in, in chapter two of my book, I give this macrobiotic model called the uh, the uh, seven levels of consciousness, where, you know, I'm sure many of you know this, Osawa already wrote about this in his book about, we go from mechanical thinking up to freedom, uh, which is seventh level. And uh, level two thinking is not very high, really, that's that's sensorial. And so our purpose in life is to strive for level seven, you know, with this, this total freedom. And which may include having them sometimes because we're free, but, you know, we're not, at, you know, slaves to anything. And when I hear the reactions of people, especially when I'm doing counseling, I see that most people are very firmly grounded at level two, sensorial, or level three, which is emotional. And uh, that's where they're stuck. And so if, if you're trying to go beyond that, and if, you, if you're so attached to something, like say the, the taste of tomatoes or potatoes, that you can't move on from there, then you, know, you don't have a chance of ever you know, shooting for the stars here, you know, going for, for level seven thinking. You're, you're just always going to be you know, 
hovering around level two and three. Even level four is, is, seems to be unreachable. That's the analytical thinking, you know, where at analytical number four, you would say, okay, if this is going to harm my health, of course, I'm not going to take it. You know, I'm not a masochist. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to do self-harm, so I don't do that. And, uh, you know, and so there's a certain freedom to say, okay, I'll, I'll give an example. I love miso soup, have it every day. But if I were to discover that miso soup is causing me to get more rheumatoid arthritis, I would have something else for breakfast. Say, so that's it for miso soup, you know, uh, because I'm not attached to miso soup. I just really like it. But people, they get so attached to food that uh, it it becomes kind of really interesting, you know, just to observe it, how uh, it becomes a very emotional and personal thing uh, to uh, just can't let go of that, you know. And so maybe I can have it because my climate's better. We say, of course, if you absolutely are going to eat nightshades then you're better off in a warm tropical climate than if you're up here in the in the north here you know the, the upper quarter of sweden lies above the arctic circle <laughs> well i i totally agree with you i just wondered what your take on it is i mean when i make tabbouleh i i steam uh little pieces of carrots for about three minutes instead of putting in uh the uh tomatoes and then i add a little bit of umeboshi vinegar so i get that feeling of, of, of a tomato but yeah i i generally eat them once or twice a year and i don't have any problems with arthritis or anything yeah that's right um and that that's i think you're on the right track there first of all you're looking for somebody to substitute as i showed also in my presentation you're looking for substitutes and also uh we're looking for uh variety and just enjoying ourselves so you know like as i said i i don't eat wheat However, I do eat wheat sometimes because I don't have any issues with the gut. And I know that if I do damage my gut lining because I eat wheat once, uh, that within four days, everything will be repaired again. So I don't make that a big issue. And I do the same thing if I'm offered potatoes, like it's, you know, it happens on when I travel around and maybe offered something got potatoes or tomatoes. And, you know, I can eat that once because I know that uh, it's not going to make any difference. But uh, it's when it becomes the major issue. Like if you look at what's on an American plate, uh, on average, potatoes are one of the major portions of people's daily food. It's one of like 30% of the optical mass on a plate is potatoes. And, and Europe is no different, at least Northern Europe here, uh, Swedes and uh, you know, Dutch and Germans, Polish, they're all big potato eaters. And, uh, you know, the potato didn't come to Europe until the middle of the 18th century from South America, but uh, it's so much loved. And uh, so you just say, well, sometimes I'm going to have it because someone's making some potato dish and, uh, you know, it's just not a problem because it's an occasional thing. And then also there, there uh, if you have it with meat, yeah, these are often meat eaters, the people who, who like potatoes. Yeah. Yeah, and, that's uh, right. Uh, yeah. Together with meat, I mean, then uh, there are the two extremes there, but at least it makes a little bit of a kind of a balance. Yeah. But yeah. when I have, or I have it with fish, but when I say, oh, I'm ve ve vegan, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, eating potatoes a lot, I'm eating vegetables with it. And I ask myself how these people get um, satisfied, you know, how they get, they get their thing going. There's only water, only kalium, and uh, uh, it's astonishing with this potato. In Germany, I, I have so many people who are like with coffee, very, very dependent on this. Uh, yeah, a sweet potato is a little bit better, now, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. <laughs> so we go into exotic. <laughs> I, I had another question uh, just a, a second if I may yeah. um, what can I do if there comes a nose bleeding uh, for somebody I mean I can what, what can I recommend what is going on I know it's a very 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 yin uh, expression of the body but what can you do to stop it you know a nose bleeding well uh, of course you, you want to try to find out why the nosebleed is happening. There are some very serious health problems that are connected with nosebleeds like cancer, et cetera. So, you know, you wouldn't be very nonchalant about this, but uh, if it just happens, you know, 
uh, once and you want to do something about it, you know, the uh, the traditional first aid things always work. Just a cold, uh, uh, wet cloth on the back of the head will stop it because that cold creates a contraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, is a time you wouldn't want to take aspirin, you know, because now your body is, mm -hmm. is bleeding too easily. But uh, what you do is make the condition more young, of course, because uh, a, a nosebleed is showing, first of all, a fragile condition. The blood vessels are too fragile. And that even a, a vitamin C deficiency could do that because vitamin C is important for the formation of collagen and for the formation of blood vessels. So, so if you're looking for the cause behind this, you know, you look, is there some deficiency? Uh, you know, what's going on here? Uh, and uh, then you, what you do immediately is just like the, the cold pack on the back of the head does it for most people. And then you ask yourself, how can I do more young things now? And one would be the umekuzu drink I mentioned. That's a good uh, firming up kind of uh, stabilizing uh, drink to increase the young. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Nice to I found to that snorting, snorting, uh, baking pot soda. Works. Wow. That's that's an imaginative <laughs> solution. That sounds good. <laughs> Stops it right away. Yeah. Yes. While I've got you, what about this idea of the tomatoes, potatoes, uh, aubergine, possibly too, that the skin is what's um, really damaging for us? And if we cook it or something and remove the skin, that it's yeah. better. That's right, because when we come back to the basic idea that these are actually uh, anti-nutrients that are there to scare away the, the predator, you know, that has the audacity to try to eat them, <laughs> uh, that the, the plant gathers most of these toxins in the skin because that's where the attack always comes from. Uh, the bite comes always on the skin. So potato skins are especially high in toxic solanine. You know, I have to really chuckle when I see uh, uh, these uh, fries, uh, French fries are called in the US, um, where they've still got the potato skin on there. And it's like, we use the whole potato here, we're health conscious. And actually that's the last thing you want is to have a potato skin because that's where the, the toxin is concentrated. And so- well, I think they even sell potato jackets or skins yeah. or something as a dish, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if you if you love potatoes, what you do is peel them with a thick peeler and get rid of not only the skin, but those first millimeters under the skin because the further into the potato, the less the concentration. So uh, there is something to that, that if you're going to have them, uh, by all means, uh, do a thick uh, uh, peeling of potatoes, get rid of the uh, tomato skins. And uh, yeah, then you can, you know, it makes some contribution to being less, less toxic. If you want to make some traditional dish that will make, you know, your, your family or friends happy. So you, you try to cut back on the toxicity. Very good. Well, shall we say goodbye again? Okay. Can I ask one more question? One more, Stephen? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Can we get your book in America directly or do we have to go through the website? Uh, well, yeah, what you do is write to me because uh, uh, the book just didn't sell. You know, there's so many books about health food uh, that, uh, you know, it gets lost every day. There are new books. And so it just didn't sell at all. So what I do is people just write to me. And I, I hooked them up to a friend of mine who lives in Montana near the Yellowstone National Park. And he has the books there for me and he will send them out to people. So all I, I get from you is your, your mail address. Yes, and then, okay. Uh, yeah, and then people can either uh, pay by PayPal or they can send a personal check. PayPal. I don't do uh, uh, cards or anything. I don't have that kind of uh, setup, but PayPal works fine as well as personal checks. And then he sends it and it works every time. Everybody gets their book. And, um, you know, I'm always happy to, uh, to do that because I may able to come back to the U.S. for two years now because of COVID. So, you know, a book like this normally sells in connection with lecture tours. Yes. And uh, so without lecture tours, basically the sale of the book has come almost to a standstill, except for, oh. when, you know, like events like this where people are interested. Definitely. Uh, I, I have the book here for Europe, so I send it out to Europe, uh, you know, to right. the UK and other places. And then in Australia, it's available too. So those those three places, I've got it. 
Uh, so yeah, it's easy to get. Just uh, just let me know, and I'll I'll reply to them. Everybody gets yeah. a personal answer from me. This is a small scale operation. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, but you email you at Stephen A. Cuff. What's the email? I know the website, but yeah, what's it's, the email? it's Hotmail. Well, you can also either it's uh, Stacuff, A S T uh, like Saint A Cuff, S T A C at uh, hotmail.com, or you can just go into my website and then it'll say contact Stephen, and then I get an automatic from the website. I get uh, oh. a message that someone's contacted me, and oh, so then very good. I'll write back then. Oh, very good. I'll do that. And uh, yeah. be, we'll yeah. be in touch that way. Yeah, and with the children with the shot, the the like eleven to seventeen year olds, what what can um, detox them? I mean, I know probably the same things that you put on that list. Oh yeah, that's right. And in fact, it's more important for them because they're the ones that are getting all the myocarditis, you know. And uh, right. if you listen to some of these uh, really knowledgeable naturopathic doctors, like Doctor uh, Brian Artis from Texas. He thinks that uh, within the next five years, half of those who get myocarditis will be dead. So he's saying that, uh, you know, these 15 year olds, he said, basically have a survival outlook like a 90 year old in a, uh, mm -hmm. in a, a, a care home. The yeah. guy within within spell, five years, they'll be dead. Can you spell artist? Artist, yeah, A-R-D-I-S. Okay, that's Brian, simple. Brian with a Y, Brian Artis, very extremely uh, knowledgeable uh, person He's from Texas, got a slight charming uh, Texas accent <laughs> there. And uh, I really enjoy uh, listening to him because he's, uh, he's no longer practicing and he just says straight out what he thinks. He has no oh. inhibitions <laughs> about it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah. And, and he knows his stuff. I'll tell you, uh, he really, uh, clarified something for me you know he said have you ever wondered why in the u.s every newborn child gets a hepatitis b vaccination as soon as they're born the first day he said it makes no sense because who's going to get hepatitis b it'll be somebody who's sleeping around with prostitutes or doing intravenous drugs so why are you why are you giving this to a newborn baby and he said it all makes sense because you give it the first day of life and the parents can never say that after they got the vaccine, the child got different. Something happened, you know, because the, the, the parents will have nothing to compare it with. As soon as the child was born, he got his first vaccination. So uh, the, the, the side effects of the vaccine will already be in the pipeline uh, from the very first day of life. And you, you don't have a time when you can say there was no vaccination. See, in Japan, they do no vaccinations for two years because... The immune system of a baby is not even prepared oh, for something like exactly. vaccination. And you have to ask yourself, how is it possible I know. that the U.S. is so corrupt, the FDA and the okay. CDC, how can they be so corrupt that they will allow this mass injury of, of exactly. children? And exactly. uh, it is, it's, uh, it's really sickening, especially when you live abroad like I do and you see other countries, uh, you know, th there's influence from the pharma industry but this level of corruption that you see in the U.S. just doesn't happen elsewhere. And I think Israel is also a good example of, of uh, openness. That there's a, has a much more open attitude towards the whole subject in Israel than you have in the U.S. Yeah. And, on and every, even on the every premature, level. premature babies get it too. My grandson, premature. Yeah. Terrible. It is terrible. Yeah. That's right. Right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Yeah, so Erica. much. I, are you planning to come to America now? It's kind of settling down. Yes, yes. I, I have a 95-year-old mother uh, <laughs> in Oregon that I haven't seen for over two years now. And at 95, you never know how long she's going to hang in there. She's got a lot of years of brown rice and broccoli behind her, so she's probably good for a few more years. But uh, uh, as soon as I've got the all clear, unfortunately, I come from uh, a state that has been very... Uh, let's say, uh, backward in dealing with these issues. Oregon is run by uh, uh, the friends of the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, uh, so it'll probably be the last state that relaxes their restrictions. <laughs> uh, well, you'll let us know. Let you not know if you're coming. Yeah, well, uh, that's a good point. I'll probably, uh, I'll probably do that. I, I used to uh, enjoy lecturing in the U.S. You know, it's... Uh, I spent most of my adult life abroad, but there's always something special about coming back to my homeland. And 
when I'm around people that have that common background with me, uh, oh, it's yes. just, you know, and they speak English like I do, you know. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, yes, well, I do appreciate your interest and uh, I will uh, try to keep people informed about that uh, when I can do a, a lecture tour again in the U.S. I'm yeah. really looking forward to it and hopefully it'll be already this uh, this fall. Yeah, stop on the East Coast before you go to, well, go to Oregon first. <laughs> yeah, then... well, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to go to Florida sometime because uh, everything I'm reading uh, on the internet is that Florida is the place to be there when it comes to uh, the, uh, the, the vaccination issue because they've got a much more relaxed attitude there. Oh, Eric, right. will be able to tell us more about that than I can, but. Uh... Oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> what moved you to Sweden? Hmm? What moved you to Sweden? Well, it was uh, a woman, actually. Seriously, the farm. Yeah, unfortunately, it didn't work out. But uh, you know, now I have nine grandchildren here, so uh, that, yeah. that pretty well gets you. Oh my gosh! So, you know, I got four four daughters who are all you know are into macrobiotics, and uh, nine grandchildren, and just amazing to see uh, like how it goes in life. So, uh, so that's how I got. Uh, got stuck you know i got shipwrecked in sweden <laughs> <laughs> last Erica? question what, so, what oh. can we do for our colons just to keep it because you know there's been a lot of you know issues with colons macro so maybe could you give one piece of advice colon yeah for the colon yeah well uh you know it's like i pointed out in my presentation first of all you want to eat fibrous foods and you want to have variety because uh, your, your colon health depends on having a broad variety of microorganisms because they all uh, like different kinds of fiber and they secrete short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are actually the food for the cells of your gut. The gut lining cells thrive from the uh, secretions of these beneficial bacteria. So that means to have a good colon function, you need to have good functioning microbiome. You have to have the proper uh, bacteria or and other microbes. And this means, uh, you know, chewing the food well, you know, macrobiotics were the champions of chewing uh, when no one else was talking about it. And you eat the right foods, you chew well, you don't eat under duress, you don't eat while standing, you know, always sit when you eat, uh, don't eat sitting in a car, you know, your, your internal organs are juggling around, uh, you know, take the time to eat in, in peace and quiet when your parasympathetic system is going to be strong. And then it all happens by itself. That's the whole idea of Wu Wei is that your body is made to be healthy. And when I think in 51 years, I have not been to see a doctor once for any kind of health condition, you know, 51 years of doctor free life. And imagine what that's worth. But it's because nature just took care of it, you know, the way it's supposed to be. And because I haven't taken any medications, I haven't even taken an aspirin. Uh, my body is doing what it's supposed to do. So here I am now at the age of 76, like, you know, almost 77. So three years from now, I'll be 80 years old. And I see other 80 year old people who come to me for counseling and it's over for them. You know, they're just kind of sitting around waiting for the end, you know, and, and I, <laughs> I still do international traveling when the, when the situation permits and uh, have a fully active life. And that's all because my lifestyle really fits my biological needs and nothing is so uh, directly affected to our health as the colon really. And uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a fermentation tank. So every meal I eat fermented vegetables, sauerkraut or cucumbers, beets, you know, some, I always eat fermented food because the, these bacteria thrive on fermented food. What's your birthday, Stephen? My birthday <laughs> is, uh, I'm a Scorpio. So I'm at the, the end of October. Listen, I'm at the end of my line, so let's have. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have the, one more question about phytic acid. Okay, we'll make it okay. quick, and then. Uh, okay. Uh, so, what are the symptoms of an overabundance of phytic acid? Uh, the uh, the symptoms are uh, 
a mineral deficiency because phytic acid uh, binds to minerals and creates a mineral salt called phytate. So you get calcium phytate, magnesium phytate, and in the phytate form, your body can't use it. It's like, you know, just doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the same thing you have with oxalates, like say high oxalate foods like spinach, uh, uh, Swiss chard, they're so high in oxalic acid, the oxalic acid combines with the minerals, you get an oxalate form. It's also like, like the phytates, uh, they're just a problem for the body. There's an interesting book called uh, Plants That Bite Back. You know, in other words, uh, <laughs> they, like, <laughs> they, they punish you for eating them. And uh, so what happens is you get a mineral deficiency and you can't get something like kidney stones because uh, these things precipitate in the body as stone forming. And sometimes even form as hard crystals, even in heart tissue and can cause inflammation. So it can become a serious problem as well. But the, the major problem is people become mineral deficient from a, uh, a high phytic acid consumption. And it's what scares people away from eating whole grain food. Like I read an article uh, last year sometime, uh, you know, warning about eating organic, uh, well, not, it didn't say organic, uh, whole foods, whole natural foods, uh, you know, because they're high in phytates, you know, and, uh, you know, you're just, you're going to get stones in your body and you're going to be, you know, really in bad shape. And there's not a, no word about that. You can soak these things and, you, you know, you can get rid of all this stuff, but it was just an attempt to get you know, herd people back into the supermarkets buying all the normal food again, you know, don't, don't buy that natural stuff, just get back into the highly processed nonsense that we sell. Hey, thanks, Steve. Okay, well, thank you for the, uh, the wonderful time we had together. It's, uh, it was a great uh, way to do it. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Maybe we can do this again sometime.